Welcome everyone to today's webinar in the Kinexus Continuous Improvement webinar series. I'm Clint Corley. I'm an account executive with Kinexus. I'm your host and moderator today. I'm filling in for Mark Graben, who is with us today, but has lost his voice due to some allergies, certainly wishing him a speedy recovery. If you'd like to learn more about Kinexus, our software, or our mission to spread continuous improvement, please visit our website at www.kinexus.com. We're really happy to be joined today by our presenter, Adam Lawrence. He's the author of a book that shares the title with today's sessions, The Wheel of Sustainability, Engaging and Empowering Teams to Produce Lasting Results. Next slide. Before I formally introduce Adam, let me cover the logistics for today's session. Adam is going to be presenting for about 40 minutes with some Q&A throughout and also at the end. He'll be inviting you to participate along the way using the Zoom chat functionality, and he'll address questions along the way. You can also, as we normally do, submit questions using the Q&A functionality in Zoom. This session is being recorded. You will get an email tomorrow with a link to the slides and the recording. If you just can't wait to rewatch, the recording will be available today on our YouTube channel and our podcast feed. We'll hope you'll also share those with others. Without any further ado, please let me introduce Adam Lawrence. Adam is the managing partner of Process Improvement Partners, LLC. He has more than 30 years of experience in process improvement, targeted at manufacturing, and business processes. He has facilitated over 300, you heard that number correctly, 300 Kaizen events in multiple industries around the world. Adam aligns with leadership, engages teams, and creates sustainable results. He's married to his wonderful wife, Peggy, for more than 30 years. They have a son, Tyler, who is his de facto IT department. Adam grew up in the DC area, has a BS in industrial engineering from Virginia Tech and earned lean certifications from the University of Michigan. Adam also uh, has been a previous guest on Mark's uh, two podcasts, his lean podcasts, and also the My Favorite Mistake series. Make sure to check those out. Uh, Again, Adam, thank you so much for the time. I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Clint. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming today. I appreciate that. Um, And thank you to Mark Raven, who's helping us in the background. And of course, Kinexus for hosting this as well. So I wanna get things started with folks. Um, Love to see where folks have joined us from. Let's use the chat for this so that everybody can see it. Where are you joining us from? And then in a second question, just for fun, what color was your first car or bicycle? Just curious to see what interesting different colors. And for those of you that might wanna know, my first car had jade green metallic Mustang color on an old Chevy Nova. So it always oh, brings back a fond memory. So um, maybe Clint, maybe share a couple. Yeah, of- Adam, we've got a, We've got an Indiana red. Uh, we've got an Ann Arbor blue. We've got a Texas white here. We've got Saskatchewan green uh, in the house as well. I see a, a Winnipeg orange Nova uh, very much. Louisville, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Seattle, dark blue, Beaverton, Oregon, silver, Huffton, Michigan, light blue, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Durham, North Carolina. Uh, Let's go Duke, Uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, (laughs) Richland, Washington, light blue, North Battle Ford, Saskatchewan, blue Honda Civic, the old Honda Civic tried and true. Oh man, tons of stuff here. Houston, Texas, Georgetown, Toronto. Stop me when I've said too much. Okay. We probably ought to keep going because we would probably enjoy finding out everybody, but keep, keep typing in folks. It's great to kind of brings a nice positive memory to most people when they think of their first vehicle. So hopefully you got that. Now, here's um, here's a little bit about me. Clint already told you about me. So I like to think of myself as a little bit of a Kaizen ninja, right? The idea is I'm facilitating and helping teams solve difficult problems in a sustainable way. And when help is needed, I come out of the shadows, not really in the shadows. I'm not that subtle actually, but the idea is to come in and help them defeat waste. So that's enough about me. Let's move into the topic that you signed up for. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the wheel of sustainability today. So what is it, why is it? So I wanted to, first of all, my image for sustaining critical solutions to problems is this wheel. It has eight spokes and one central hub, which is leadership commitment. Now I'm gonna go into each element 
separately in different slides, but I wanted you to understand why I felt this was so critical. For me, the image of the wheel tells me the strength of the wheel is in all its elements. And if I were to take a spoke away, the wheel would work, but be weaker. And if I took the hub away, which is leadership commitment, the, the wheel falls apart completely. The reason why I built this image over many, many years is that I was having difficulty sustaining solutions. Teams were coming up with incredible solutions to problems that had been plaguing them. And then when the Kaizen or project was over, the problems would creep back. So I made it my mission over the past decade or so to keep that from happening. And through many different trial and error efforts, I came up with this wheel. So without any further ado, I'm gonna take you through all of these elements. And we're gonna start with the first one called notification. So, ah, no, we're not. We're gonna start with the first one, the key, which is leadership commitment. So this is the thing that holds everything together. So what am I saying about leadership? What I'm saying is leaders need to be visible and supportive. What they have to be able to do is support every element of the wheel. They have to be willing to participate and do everything necessary to help their teams and their people have a winning experience. So that's all easy to say, of course. So how do we get that leadership commitment? How do we start to build that? So my method is to provide that image of the wheel. And I start through discussions with leadership about their responsibility and accountability around the wheel. And then I, then I begin, if they're interested and anticipating a win and they wanna win, we do a thing I call chartering. So I'm sure a lot of you have chartered. So I break it down into four very simple elements. So the first thing is leaders need to understand what is the problem that they're trying to solve? Why does it matter? How will it improve the customer experience? How will it improve safety and productivity? What are the measurable elements of the problem that are becoming pain to the business or to the people in the business, their employees? So we need to, we need to define that very well. It needs to be compelling. It needs to matter. It needs to matter to leaders. It needs to matter to the people that are dealing with the problem. So very often we're working with very vague statements. We're not servicing the customer as well as we'd like. And where I work with leaders is let's talk about what is the true impact. So it takes us 14 days to service the customer. Industry average is eight. We need to get down to six to be best in class. Now that's a problem statement. Plus, what would each day be worth? What would it be worth to our employees? What would it be worth to the customer? What would it be worth to the business? If we can make it measurable, that will make it even more real and compelling and make it easier to marshal a team together. The second part of chartering is the objective. So if the team were to solve this critical problem, what would that look like? So can we get those 14 days down to six? Will we implement two safety improvements per team member? Will it take less time? Will it be less stress? Can we rate ourselves better? What would a win look like within the scope of the work that the team is doing? Can they tell if they're winning? Are they on track to win? Okay, so I use winning a lot. The next step then would be who should be on the team to help win? What is the winning team? So I typically coach leaders and sponsors to say people within the process should be the ones participating. They're the ones that are feeling the pain. They will know if what they did made things better. Perhaps a customer of the process, perhaps a manager of those working in the process, perhaps a supplier to the process, perhaps some outside objective person that can give some other idea, somebody from a different location. What is that winning team? If we're gonna put effort into this chartering or if we're gonna put effort into the project, we wanna make sure we win. What does that look like? So many times I might be walking Gembo with those leaders and we meet people that have passion for it or are interested in helping win. That is a winning team. The fourth question is the final one. Well, who owns the output when it's over? Who has that 24 hour responsibility? Who's gonna deal with everything that the team has done? That owner of the output ideally should be the team leader because what they'll be able to do is marshal resources. They'll be able to understand if the work is something that they can live with. Some of my terms that I use might be pretty frank and direct. They won't let us do something stupid. They won't let us do something out of policy. They won't let us do something illegal. Uh, that's part of my job as well, but 
you know, not knowing every industry, you need to understand what are the requirements, what are the specifications. So that owner of the output ideally would be the team leader. Now, when we create that charter, that becomes a contract with the team. The leader, their commitment is, I'm gonna give you the team, we're gonna make them 100% committed to this effort. We're gonna clear their calendar, nothing else is more important, unless it's a family emergency or a safety issue, but they're gonna be there 100% of the time and their job is to work on that problem and come to a solution in a sustainable way. Now, what the leaders have to do They've provided that contract. They have to basically say yes to anything the team wants to do then. That is the contract team. We're giving you this extreme responsibility. Leaders, you have to be able to say yes. The team is going to ask for things, either time or effort or help, or maybe sometimes resources or money. But as a good facilitator, we need to make sure we're keeping the team focused on doing the right things in the best way possible. Leaders, you have to be able to say yes. So that's a lot on leadership commitment. It is a critical element. I get oftentimes asked, well, who are we saying the leaders are? Typically the, the people that can marshal the resources together, that can provide the resources, can get them off of their normal job, can actually pay and engage the consultant if you're bringing somebody from the outside. So I'm gonna stop right here for the first set of questions. So if anybody has any questions, please use the Q&A not the chat this time, but we're going to look at both just in case, but look at the Q&A and see if anybody has any specific questions about leadership commitment. And Clint, I'll give you about 10 seconds to see if anybody has anything to ask. Got a, got a little mental countdown going on right now. Chat or Q&A, folks, Q&A preferred, doesn't matter though. Any questions so far? Looks like none so far. Adam, fire okay. away. All right, we'll move on. So what I meant to say earlier was this is the first spoke of the wheel notification. So if somebody comes in with a, a question now, we'll, we'll bring it in after notification. Okay, so what is notification? So in traditional sense, what we're doing is we're presenting the change. The team has made a change. They've solved the business problem. Now we need to notify the organization of this. But more than that, because you know, people have very limited attention spans. It needs to be aligned with the vision of what we're trying to accomplish. It has to tell us why, not what. It must be compelling. So who should participate in this? Well, leaders should participate. Team members should participate. The people in the audience have to feel like we have done something in their best interests, something in the best interest of the customer, something that's going to keep them safe, keep them productive, keep them stress-free. This message, it can't be long, but it needs to be clear and compelling. And people need to know why. This is the entry point because we're gonna to need to tell the whole organization about a critical change that we've made. Now, the commitment of leaders is that we create the time to get the message to everybody. We're not emailing everybody. We are speaking with them. We are giving them a chance to engage. Who participates, people will look at those folks describing the change to see, do they really care? Does this really matter? Why should I care if I'm in the audience? How does this affect me? Now, this is the first of many, but it's a first entry point. Are there any questions about that or the prior slide? Hey, Adam, we, we do have a question from the, yep. from the prior slide. Yep. Uh, the question is, how do, how do I get this commitment when there are time constraints or a time constraint? Right, so that's a great question. So the good point is there's always time constraints. There's no doubt that the work that we, need, that we are doing has to be important enough to be able to marshal resources. So I'll give you a very quick example. Had a, had a group in Vancouver, Washington, wanted to reduce the time of changeover. Um, we were trying to cut the time in half which we were able to accomplish. And when we were marshalling the team, uh, we were able in the charter to find out that this was worth anywhere from one to $3 million annually, okay? That was their data. Now, one was kind of an, a conservative estimate, three was probably more like it. So when the plant manager said to me, well, how do I get two team members from another location to join us for the week? I looked him in the eye and I said, well, can you think of anything else going on in your company 
that week that is worth up to $3 million. Okay, because we had clearly chartered, logically using the data from the organization, then it becomes very easy to make that judgment to be able to marshal resources. But yes, it's difficult. Think about it in a factory when I have multiple shifts, we're gonna bring people in from every shift. How are we gonna get them off their job? How are we gonna convince them this is worth their time? Well, that's why the winning team matters. Picking people that care and getting the right people. If solving it is really critical to the business, it shouldn't be that hard. Time is, uh, is a resource that will never get back. So you need to prioritize to the things that will matter the most. Hope that helps. Yeah, I think so. I just had another comment here from Dr. M essentially saying, where are we now? Where should we go? And to your point, why, right? Why should we get there? Um, no other questions at, at this point, Adam. Okay, great. Thank you for that question. It's very helpful. Okay, so notification is a pretty traditional route to describe to groups of people, you know, and it, and for those of us that have sat in group meetings, it's very easy to get lost about three minutes into the discussion. There's 40 people in the room, three people are asking questions, the other 37 are looking at their smartphones or are wondering about the next meeting they have to go to. So this next element is called training and review. And I've modeled it after training within industry, but in simplest form, this is a one-on-one -on -one interaction. So people that are going to have to implement the new change, the new standard work, we are going to tell them about it. We are going to demonstrate that we know how to do it by showing them how to do that. And then we are going to have them demonstrate to us that they truly understand it. So it's a one-on-one -on -one interaction. It takes longer this way, but in my view, it takes actually shorter in the overall. It shows that I care. It shows that I'm committed. It allows people to interact directly. They don't have to worry about what 37 other employees think. They need to know what they need to know. And we wanna give them an environment that makes it comfortable and safe for them to, to ask any difficult question that they may have. So how do we do this efficiently? Well, clearly one person can't train 300 people. So typically what we do is we have all the team members, all the project team members. They know what they did. We teach them how to do tell, show, and do during the session. The wheel, by the way, is implemented during the session. This is not homework. This happens during a Kaizen event or a project so that they are doing this work while it's happening. They have these conversations. So if I have 12 members on the team, that means I have 12 people that can do tell, show, and do. And across 300 people, that means I'm gonna have 25 individual interactions, each of those 12 people, okay? What this does, again, is it demonstrates your caring. It demonstrates leadership commitment to allow this activity to occur. And it gives every single person in the organization who's going to be impacted by the change, the opportunity to give feedback, input, and get greater understanding of what's expected of them. And I'm gonna stop for questions there. Yeah, another quick pause here for questions. Drop your questions in the Q&A. We'll give uh, just a couple seconds and a little countdown as I vamp and try to waste some time here with some meaningless <laughs> words, giving people a second to get their questions into the Q&A. All right, remember that if you don't have one now, there's gonna be the next element to speak about. Plenty of time for questions, plenty of time. Plenty of time. All right, Adam, I'd say go ahead. All right, well, here is something that you may not have known. I love giving stuff away. So I am going to give away a free signed Wheel of Sustainability book to whoever is closest to the answer. Do this one in the chat, please. But in April, I did a free Kindle download week and a number of people took me up on that opportunity. This was in April. So whoever guesses the number closest to how many people took me up for the free Kindle download, please type in a number. Don't say everybody, say a number. And whoever is closest will win a free book. Now, if there's a tie, I'll send out two books. So I have lots of books to send out. Um, I love giving them away. So please take the opportunity. A little later on in the presentation, I'll tell you what the answer is. Clint already knows, so you can try to bribe him. Mark knows <laughs> you can try to bribe him. He's quiet in the background. There will be one other opportunity for a different, uh, for a book. Okay. Any questions come in at all, Clint? No, no questions. Lots Just of answers. Numbers. Really appreciate the engagement here, guys. Lots of answers. 
Okay, great, great. We love giving away free stuff. So hopefully you find the books worth your effort of putting in a number. Okay, we're gonna go into visible evidence then. Okay, so I, I have an image of a parking lot. The idea here is we've made a change. We wanna make sure everybody knows how to do the change, but we don't wanna to have to crawl into the deep detail. We wanna be able to see from far away. So I have a picture of a parking lot. So how many times have you driven to a place of business and realized, I don't wanna park there. You're able to tell from far away. What we wanna be able to do is see from far away that people either are or are not properly following the new process or the new standard work. So a question I always ask my teams to answer is, how do I know? How do I know they're doing it right? How do I know they're doing it wrong? How do I know that they have everything they need? How do I know that there aren't questions? How do I know that the tools are in the right place? So that question gets embedded in their brains. Most of my team members would tell you, tired of hearing Adam ask that question, but eventually I want them asking that question. If they know, that's great. If anybody who is even unfamiliar with it knows, that's even better because then we can all help. Then leaders show their commitment by helping. If a tool is not sitting on a tool board properly, a leader can come in, notice that the tool is missing, help try to find it and bring it back and reinforce how critical it is to have the tool ready when it's necessary. So the next step is to make it impossible to do the wrong thing. People always try to do their best. So I'll say most of the time, people try to do their best. We wanna make it impossible to do the wrong thing. So they don't have to guess, they don't have to search, they don't have to worry. Everything they need is right where they need it and anybody can tell that things are as they should be, okay? So I'm gonna stop for questions and then we'll do a little bit of a demo. Anybody have any questions? Loving the question breaks back and forth. You know, I, it's one of my one of my favorite things to do during presentations, guys. Again, questions in the Q and A. Give a couple give a couple seconds to get those uh, to get those out of there. Uh, we do have one from Sam. Um, oh, interesting. It's a good question. Sam asks: Would mistake proofing eliminate creativity? So what we're trying to do, that's a great question, right? So the simpler you make things for people to do the right thing, it allows their mind to stop worrying about the mundane elements of their job and they can become even more creative. So I think a lot of people that are lean practitioners anyway would say, great standard work opens up creativity. Simplify the mundane repetitive tasks, make it a no brainer to pick the right tool for the job, never having to search for it. Now I can use my mind to ensure that everything I'm doing is safe, proper, and then I can start to think about improvements to the process. So I think it, my opinion is it opens up creativity. Great question. Got a, got a couple others here. Uh, Kevin asks, uh, as a certified sensei, does your, does your wheel fall in line with PDCA? Fantastic question. So you're going to have to evaluate that. I truly do believe that it does. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about PDCA in a, in a later uh, aspect. I used PDCA a whole lot over the last 10 or so years developing the wheel. So many adjusts due to finding that elements were not clear or elements were, were missing or the way we look at the element doesn't really sustain. So how do we strengthen the element? So this, to me, I'm on whatever iteration I'm on, 150, 2000, I don't know what it is. This is the best I have at the moment. I'm certain it could be even better. Great question, but PDCA definitely in the full development of the wheel. It used to be a molecule, it wasn't a wheel, and it used to have uh, six folks and now it has eight. So fantastic question. Uh, maybe one more here. Nestor uh, made a statement. It's that that you know it's, it should be simple to follow up on the rules. I, I guess I guess what are some ways or some some kind of quick tips for how to simplify following up on on the rules and following up on those types of things? Okay, so let me take you into the demo. This is how this is me identifying how simple it is to make it impossible to do the wrong thing. So get ready to do some chatting. Perfect. Okay. So first question is what is that? What is that? Looking for answers in the uh, in the Don't chat. Be afraid. Here. Got, it uh, seems obvious. Wrench, wrench, a box end wrench. Right. Uh, right. Two, uh, 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 a gauge, a spanner. Okay. I'm not really sure what a spanner is. Yeah. So that apparently is the UK version of wrench. So the answer is we really don't know. 
because Adam's not the best artist, right? So seen a lot of people say, I know where to put the wrench. Okay, so okay, let's just say it's a wrench, not a great draw. Okay, now what is it? Okay, now we know not only that it's a wrench, but it's a 9 16 wrench. Okay, fantastic. Now, does anybody know where we got it? Where did that, so that wrench is sitting in your shop or in your office or in your, in your garage or your backyard. Where'd that come from? Does anybody know? Any guesses? The store. The Great. store, <laughs> right. Maybe, yes, yeah, so yeah, that's where it originally did, yeah. So remember the word help. So I can't help you yet. I can't help you. All I know is I got this wrench. I don't know where it came from. Now I know where it came from. So it came from a place we're going to call a weld shop only because that's my, that's my image of it. Okay, great. So I have now found this out in my shop somewhere. Uh, and it says, I, I belong to the weld shop. Okay, so where does it go? Well, could say the weld shop. Uh, but where in the weld shop? Well, we don't know that yet. We don't know that yet. So let's do the next thing. So now we've got, uh, we're in the weld shop and now we've drawn an outline. And you might say that's good enough. I've seen teams stop right here. And I say, well, but now is that impossible to do the wrong thing? Like, is that, are we sure that the three quarter wrench doesn't go under this outline? Because outlines are typically bigger than the tool. So how do we know? Well, the answer is we don't yet. We don't yet. Now I think we pretty much know, okay? So when teams like to stop at the prior slide, what I encourage, I say, it's not impossible to do the wrong thing yet. It's, it's not possible yet to help. Anybody could help. Think about Disney World, where people don't speak the same language. They come from all over the world, ages one to 101, and everybody knows where to stand. Everybody knows where to go. Everybody knows how much time they're going to be waiting in line. Well, that's because Disneyland, Disney World, whatever, they do things that make it almost impossible to do the wrong thing. And this is, this is just an example of that. Let's just make life easier for people. Let's take that extra three seconds to put the labels on. And now I know where to go. Anybody can help. It doesn't matter who you are. You can help. Okay. So let's take a quick question break for any of this. Yeah, I've got, got one on deck. Uh, do you have examples of shadow boards in a healthcare setting? Do I personally? I personally do not. I mean, I've seen shadow boards in so many great places, my local Chick-fil-A and, and others, but I would bet that some of the folks that are helping me today have some nice examples. I do not. I do not. I mean, shadow board, to me, a tool is a tool is a tool. If it helps you do something, whether it be a clipboard, whether it be a sheet of paper, whether it be a physical tool, whether it be a supply cabinet, uh, I've done things in um, food grade industries where you know they can only do have certain types of labels and so on. But basically what you're trying to do is give people the information they need so that they can help and make the right decisions. So personally, I don't think industry matters. Uh, what, what I think does matter is you have to follow the protocols, right? So if certain substances aren't allowed to be used, certain adhesives, then you have to be able to find those things that can be used. Great question. I specifically do not have my own examples of that. We've got some great engagement in the chat. Looks like a few folks uh, from that industry are chiming in to help answer too. Uh, no, other questions as, no other questions as of right now, Adam. Okay, great. Thank you all. Okay, so this is actually a picture of that weld shop. So I was so proud of these guys uh, a few years ago, the, the nicest weld shop I've ever seen. So the thing in the bottom right corner is the, is the table where all the work is done. So basically all they did in what we would have called a 5S event, but it really wasn't that, was they identified the weld table as the critical element of their shop and everything was optimized to that. But you basically have made it impossible to lose anything. They know where everything has to go and where how it's used. And they were able to reduce the response time. Their ability to get ready to help a factory line that was down went from two hours to 10 seconds. So that is not an exaggeration. So the idea of all tools available is that everything you need is, is, is available to you. So for example, if I needed that 916 wrench in two locations, what I want to do is I want to hang that 916 wrench in two locations, have two 916 wrenches. What I don't want to do is put it in a toolbox and carry it from one place or the other. So let's logically locate. Let's make sure no one has to search or transport. 
the typical things, things that, you know, I can't have, but so many MIG welders, so I can't have them everywhere in the factory, but the things that, you know, that can be lost easily, let's have them right where I need them. Okay, here's where leadership commitment comes in. When the team says, I need three of these wrenches, no one should ever ask them, how much does it cost? No one should ever say, are you sure you need three? Couldn't it be two? The team has come to the conclusion that this will help people do their work in the safest, most efficient manner to solve the problem they've been contracted to do in their charter. The answer has to be yes. So let's make all tools available to them so that there's no searching or transporting and they feel the commitment to them. Okay, I'm gonna stop for questions there. Yeah, I got, got two on deck for you. Uh, first for Ryan, uh, he says, what are good questions to ask to make sure things are mistake proof? Okay, so great. So the first question I always ask is how do I know? So does, how do I know that this is the best place for the tool? How do I know that the person knows what to do with it? How do I know it's where it should be? How do I know that they know how to use it? You keep asking how do I know enough times and it forces you to think through, okay, wait a minute, that's right-handed. Do we have any lefties? You know, so keep asking those kinds of questions and all of a sudden, the more questions you answer, listen, you're not gonna solve every problem, solve 95% of it and you're in good shape, right? At least keep asking questions until you run, run out of time. You'll run out of time before you run out of ideas, I promise you that. This is not about making things look pretty. This is about making things safer, more productive, best customer delivery possible, best for the employees, you know, you'll prioritize if you've got good facilitation, you will prioritize. Let's only work on the most important things. We'll make it pretty later. No one ever makes it pretty later, okay? Let's just make the system so that it's sustainable and gives people the solution that they need so desperately. Great question, any other questions? Yeah, we got another one. So let's say we have a shadow board and a tool has been taken uh, for yes. someone to use it, but a lot of people have the ability to use that tool. How do I know who has it? and who's using it. Right, so great question. So remember one thing is we want the tools right where they're needed. Okay, so hopefully it's key, staying within its home location, right? But who has it? Right, we don't put trackers on the tools. Not yet, I haven't. Maybe some people do that if it was worth more. Um, but this is a culture of helping and you're gonna see in the next elements how we kind of deal with that under accountability, layered audits and clear benefits. So great question, kind of leading me into the next the next element. Any other questions? All good for now, power on. All right, thank you. So the next one is clear benefits. So I will tell you, again, remember that the teams implement the wheel during the session. This is not a homework assignment. So my teams typically like this element the least because what I do early on, the team is thinking of things that they're going to do. They are now going to go out in Gemba, go out onto the floor, go out into the office and talk to people that are not on the team and get their input. Find out what they think. Now they haven't been in the team room. They haven't been out on Gemba with us solving and prioritizing and being creative. So it's raw. They get this feedback. Normally humans expect the worst and hope for the best. So sometimes they get yelled at, sometimes they get argued with, but very oftentimes somebody says, well, have you considered this? Like earlier, I said, looks like you designed this for righties, but I'm a lefty. And so the team early on, and I always have them go out early, not don't wait until it's all solved because it ain't all solved. Go out early, day one, day one and a half, go out and talk to some people. One-on-one, -on -one, get their view. Sometimes they get yelled at. Sometimes they say, how could you think this would be helpful? but then they have to really improve their solution. And sometimes the solution is that good. They have to learn how to explain it. So what does it do? What we're trying to do is make things simpler, safer, and easier for people. We want to value their input and we want the person that we're speaking with, eventually it has to help them personally. If it doesn't help them personally, if they don't view it that way, they're likely not going to follow the new standard work. So clear benefits is critical. Now. Where do leaders fall in? Well, they have to give us that opportunity. They have to be understanding that their folks are gonna get yelled at sometimes. Sometimes people are gonna see the negative in all of this. They might even get a visit to their office. Uh, I've been taken to the principal's office a few times because people, again, expect the worst and hope for the best. But the team has the best interests 
of the rest of the organization in mind for working on that. But when they have to explain themselves, it really drives their accountability deeper. And sometimes it opens up some feedback that they didn't realize and keeps them from making some critical errors. So again, painful, but critical to do. That's what I call clear benefits. Some people say with them, what's in it for me? Uh, but again, you know, at 2 a.m. when I'm not there to manage the process, the thing that's going to have the person doing the work is that they have to see it as easier to do, simpler, safer, makes more sense. If they don't see it that way, they're going to go back to their old methods. Okay, time for a question. Any questions on that? Hey, no, no open questions right now. I, I actually had one on, on the, the previous question. You used the example of, of a MIG welder, right? We can't have infinite MIG welders uh, all over right. the place. Is there ever a situation where you know, there should be a more formalized kind of check-in, check-out process for, for certain tools or, or certain uh, things that get used? Absolutely. So, you know, I always leave that to the policies and procedures of the, of the organization that I'm helping. But, you know, simple things that are easily replaced and, you know, we've got something right where we need it. Absolutely no need for that. But if you think high value or we really need to track something, hey, as long as, this, as long as it doesn't slow things down, as long as I don't have to go find a key to unlock a location and that person that has the key has been out for two days, right? So those are the questions that I ask teams when they wanna have a more formalized sign in and sign out process. Can we do it in such a way that it's hugely visible, anybody can see it, and no one is gonna keep us from being able to do our work. As long as it doesn't slow anything down, and if they need that increased accountability, absolutely. And if you're doing inventory levels, right? So if I have eight of something and they're consumable, and my reorder point is two, then absolutely you should be keeping track of that, either through Kanban or storeroom or whatever method, whatever system. Most of my work is with teams. I try to work within their existing systems, you know, because we're going to introduce new, a lot of new anyway. So we want to keep things familiar to them unless it keeps them from accomplishing their goal. Okay, great, great question. Thank you for that. Uh, Any others? No, no others right now. I'll, okay, uh, we're going to move on. So moving on. Uh, this is about, this starts to get more people involved called, I call it layered audits. I know a lot of people do the same thing. So what I've always told teams is we're going to need to be able to audit our new system, whatever it is. And that audit has to be less than five minutes because anybody can clear five minutes on their calendar. If it takes an hour, it's impossible. You know, you'll never get people to do it. It can be random. You don't have to audit the entire system all at once. You should be meeting different people, but it needs to be two way. You and I, I should be coming to Gemba where you're doing your work and we should have a conversation. What I'm doing is I'm learning more about it and you're learning how important it is and we're assessing things together. We're not hiding from it. We're reinforcing the importance and we wanna make the audits simple enough that anybody can be an auditor. Why do we wanna do that? Because we wanna expose people to this critical new way of doing things that's making people safer, more productive, better for the customer. So audits have to be simple, audits have to be visual, audits have to be comfortable. And oh, by the way, it needs to be easy to tell if something isn't working properly or is working properly. If it is working properly, congratulate that person. If it isn't working properly, let's redirect the behavior and change it to the right thing. So anybody has to be able to do it, they have to be comfortable doing it. And again, you can always give five minutes of your day. You may not be able to do an hour. So let's try to keep it to five minutes. Let's only focus on the most critical elements or let's rotate through and let's rotate auditors so that anybody can feel like they have an accountability and responsibility. Now it's layered. The person doing the work audits their work. They do that continuously. The person managing the person doing the work should audit with less frequency. It works its way all the way up to the CEO of the company who should be auditing once a year, once a quarter, whatever it is. But he or she should be walking through a process every so often and seeing it looks healthy, it's right, everything's as it should be, or here's where I help. Okay, any questions on auditing? And I'm just an example of a 5S audit sheet that I've used in many places, it's kind of an industry simple standard. Any questions on that? Yeah, we, we do have a question here. So so change can be tough, especially for the person who, you know, you're trying to help coach through to change. And, and sometimes the, the person receiving that message may not perceive it as something that is a benefit 
uh, for them or, or a benefit for the greater good? What are some, what are some tools for how to communicate uh, that with people? Well, you know what? I go back to training and review. So first of all, if I show that I can do it and I can show why it matters to me and that I care and then give you the opportunity to do it with me to help you actually see, it's easy to look at something without trying and thinking that it's bad, right? That's human nature. We, we all live with that. But if I participate with you, so think of training within industry, the folks that know what that is. You know, I can't go into all that detail. There's so much detail there. But that was designed to help people see a new way of doing things that is beneficial to them. But just by telling them that, they only retain three to 5%. But when they're doing, or there's a combination of speaking and seeing and demonstrating and trying and teaching, now I can retain 90%. And now it can make sense. You know what? If it doesn't make sense, then there may be a flaw. And the team needs to go back and make the correction. So this is a one-on-one. -on -one. This is person to person. And again, leadership commitment. If this person needs more time, leadership has to commit to that. Or if this person refuses, and by the way, that has happened. If there's a refusal, well, the business deals with that in a different way. The team is not responsible to correct individuals' behavior where they refuse. That's, that's a whole different ballgame. But when we're trying to make things better, the team always has the intent to try to make things better. This is not make people work harder. What's great about Lean is we're trying to simplify work. We're trying to improve the safety and productivity. What we're not trying to do is make people work harder. Great, great question. Any other questions? I have two more elements. No open questions right now. Okay, I'm going to move on. Oh, wait, but wait, there's another prize. Okay, so the first one I asked you, how many people took advantage of my April free Kindle download? Just because I'm not that creative, I did another free Kindle download opportunity in June. So my question this time is how many people in June took advantage of that free Kindle giveaway? So just type in a number. Again, don't use words. <laughs> Whoever's closest to the number, somebody in the last webinar said, as many people as asked for it. Well, they were technically right, but we're not going to count that one this time. That's my PDCA on my uh, on my uh, prize giveaways. Okay, so a couple slides and I'll give the answers. Okay. The next component is accountability. So accountability is easy to say, but here's my image for that. If you had a small child about to touch a hot stove, you would jump up from your seat and do everything possible to keep that child from burning his or her hand. Now, you might not be able to keep them from crying when you're yelling, what are you doing? But the idea is you would immediately correct the behavior and you care enough that you would do that. You're not gonna let them get hurt. The idea here is that if somebody is choosing not to follow the new procedure, you personally, everybody should personally take accountability to correct that behavior, not because they're wrong or stupid, because what we care, they may not realize. They may not have gotten the opportunity, the memo, the discussion, the one-on-one. -on -one. They may not see the sign in front of them. I've actually seen that happen. Did you know there's a tool right there above you? Oh, I didn't even see that because people keep their heads down sometimes. So do you care enough to take the time? You're late for a meeting and you see something about to happen, whether it puts somebody in harm's way or not, you're gonna step in, you're gonna be late to your meeting, you're gonna provide the help, you're gonna redirect the behavior, you're gonna explain why it matters and why this will be easier and safer. And eventually they'll realize, hey, this does matter. Now, you're gonna to have to explain why you're late to a meeting, but I think it's okay. The people in the meeting need to know that's how critical this change is made. Remember, we're trying to sustain critical business improvements, critical safety improvements. We're not sustaining uh, something that's gonna save half a second. Okay, we can do that too. What we're trying to do is sustain something that took customer time from 14 days down to one day. Does that matter? If it matters, then absolutely hold yourself accountable to it. Provide the help. Help is a great four letter word. I'm gonna stop for questions. Easier said than done, by the way. Much easier said than done. Much easier. Much easier said than done. So think about that image though. Do we want to allow somebody to do the wrong thing? Because if we walk by the person doing the wrong thing, what they start to believe is that the right thing, that the rest of these changes are, they are not committed to them. They are not real. They are not helpful. So earlier I talked about leadership commitment and chartering. One of the things I do is I say, once we do this, you realize this is your responsibility. You will be asked to or not asked to step in when necessary. So 
you have to be a willing to do it. If you're not willing to do it, we should not move forward. Okay, any questions? No, I'm gonna no move on. Questions. Last element, okay, so this is me telling stories. So I'm a storyteller and what I learned, I use a term called recognition, recognizing that a cause created an effect. So here's your PDCA cycle. We did all this great work and something happened because of it. Hopefully something positive, right? So let's say that it was positive. Let's understand what caused that to happen. Let's tell stories about it. So what I used to do was have team members describe what they did, why they did it, and what the impact has been. And the more people that they told the story to, the more they would start to get entrenched in the organization. The ideal situation is when somebody tells that same story that wasn't on the team, wasn't even there when it happened, and they tell the story as if they were there. This truly locks in commitment. So in the far distant past, family histories and science and all these things in nature were told and handed down through stories. I say the story is critical and, and important. Tell those stories. Leaders should be telling those stories. They should be getting people excited. What we really want to do is solve that first business problem and then get more people excited to solve other problems in this way, to get teams together and, and learn from each other and be creative and make things better, safer, more productive, better for the customer. Okay. I think that's my last question break. Any last Maybe. questions here on the last question break? <laughs> We'll do some at the end if you want to. Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't wear out my welcome or run out of time. I think something came in on the queue. Right, here we go. Let's see. Uh, okay, Kevin. Kevin says, I've seen people get stuck in the plan do, plan do, plan do, plan do, plan do phase yeah. of PETA. Any, trick, any tricks on breaking that habit? Well, right. I mean... Certainly for our teams, when we're doing this work, the check is, did we meet our objective, right? <laughs> right? So if you didn't meet the objective, if we tried the changeover and we timed it and it didn't cut the time in half, well, clearly we're going to improve, right? So let's act. Let's, let's do some more. Let's do some more. Now, look, you're going to run out of time before you run out of ideas. You do the best you can, but you should always check. Plan do is nothing until you find out what happened, right? If you don't, you're just guessing. You don't want to shoot into the wind. So you, you want to know, you want to find out, you want to measure. That's why measurable objectives are so critical. And some people would say, hey, look, it takes us 30 days to get to the customer. Are you telling me in a week you're going to know if you got it down to five days? Okay, you're not going to know for sure. But then I do a thing. We do a flow check, right? We're going to basically pretend we're the process, be the ball, work our way through the process as if it's happening. And then the team decides, have we done enough? Now, after the event is over, after the product, of course, we're going to measure, but let's at least estimate. Let's at least see if we believe we're better. I mean, they're the experts in the room. They should know if it's better. Any other questions before I move on? Adam, I'll tell you what, we're going to go ahead and wrap. We'll do some announcements. I think that'll, that'll give some more time for questions to funnel in uh, okay. as we get going here as well. You want to go ahead and hit next slide. Okay, let me, let me give the answers to the two contests as everybody's chat, chatted in. So the April contest was 212 and the June contest uh, free Kindle download was 2,214. So whoever won, we'll let them know by the end of the session. I just wanna thank you all. If you wanted to know more about the wheel, there is a book I wrote last year, just trying to tell many more stories than I had time for and give you ways to implement, you know, what to do, what not to do, just some of my experiences, some in the home, some in business, some in service, whatever. I, I thought I've even been kicked out of my kitchen because I tried to use the wheel in the wrong way. <laughs> Okay. Um, so the next slide is just contacting me. You know, we'll go past that, but love to continue the conversation. You see, I think you're going to talk to how to get in touch with me, but you see some of the contact ways. Please take the opportunity. I love talking about this, as you know. And I think Clint wants me to move on to the next slide. So here you go. <laughs> he said we're going to do announcements. So let's do that. No, th thanks again, Adam. This was uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, we had some great engagement in, in the chat. Some awesome questions come through. So thanks to our participants as well. Friendly reminder, this slide deck is going to come out. So all of Adam's contact info will, will be there. If you got any other questions, reach out to anybody on our team or Adam directly, and, and we'll make sure you guys get in touch. 
Uh, a few just real quick announcements. Upcoming webinars, if you're a Kinexus customer, our training team office hours are this week on the 12th. You can register now <clears throat> at kinexus.com slash webinars. Our next presentation webinar, which is open to, to everyone, will be on September the 14th by Karen Ross and Jessica House speaking about the important topic of psychological safety. And we're going to be opening registration there up pretty soon. Pretty soon. Go ahead. Next slide. Uh, look, you can check out all of our past webinars in our library, kinexus.com slash webinars. I think that's about the ninth time I've said that this afternoon. All of that content is free to everybody. Subscribe to our blog at blog.kinexus.com for red hot improvement content delivered directly to your inbox. Last slide or last couple slides here. As I mentioned earlier, the audio of today's session is going to be on the Kinexus Continuous Improvement Podcast feed. You can find that wherever you get podcasts. One more slide. We're right into Q&A, wide open. I do have one just right out of the gate that, uh, that, that is my personal question. I was prepping this morning and I listened to uh, your, your webinar preview uh, that, that you did with Mark. And, and one of the things that you talk about is just being aware that chaos is going to creep back in. I love that, that little sound bite. I was wondering, well, what are some telltale signs that chaos is creeping back in? And how do, we, how do we fight the urge to just turn back into firefighters whenever those things happen? Right. That's such a great question because chaos will creep back in. So, okay, what are some simple signs? One of the signs is you didn't have the session where you did one-on-ones with folks, okay? Another way would be if audits are not being signed off in a visual way with whatever frequency was agreed to. Um, if a tool is missing on the tool board or you see somebody not following the standard work and they've ma they're making excuses for it, I mean, that's the reality of it. You know, it's easy to do, right? So what do we do? So what I have coached leaders to do is, you know, you never, you never back off, right? It's a reality though, that business is going to cause things to happen. But again, we're working on critical elements for the business. This is the opportunity to teach a discipline to the organization in such a way. Now, here's the good news, Clint, and whoever might be thinking the same thing. I have people send me pictures all the time of the thing beyond the Kaizen that looks actually better, where there are green numbers on the board where there used to be half red numbers or the next area that they organized because somebody was watching the team and they said, ooh, can you come to see us next? So what you need to do is you need to grab on. I'm going to take the positive side of this. Look, the goal is to win. People like to win. My joke is the team that I follow in football doesn't like to win, but most people like to win. So when you get a win, you realize that I want another win and another win. So I always coach my leadership team is be looking for that second win, third win. When people start to show interest, give them the opportunity, you know, because if you saved a million here and you can save 500,000 there, those opportunities don't just fall to your feet all the time. So why not take the opportunity? If I can make an ER safer for people, it takes 30 minutes to wait instead of two hours to wait. I mean, lives will be saved. So why would we let chaos get in the way of saving lives or saving money or making things better for our employees? One thing I didn't say was I wanna thank everybody that joined. I mean, I wanna thank Kinexus and Clint. Thanks for being a great relief pitcher. Mark, thanks for hanging in there. <laughs> Poor Mark. <laughs> <laughs> lost his voice. He thinks it doesn't sound good. It sounds fine. But anyway, it's just great to see the or your organization was going to make sure we had a winning experience. So I hope those of you that joined and hung in there enjoyed. Now, Clint, do you know who won? Do you yet know who won the contest? Yeah, we, we do. So so Mark was, was gracious enough to drop them uh, in the chat. We have, uh, it looks like we have three winners here. Uh, awesome. Kevin Burgess. Okay. Nick Coderre. I'm sure I'm saying that incorrectly. C-O-D-E-R-E. -E. And then Kim Pottinger. Great. Well, congratulations to you all. And once I get an email and mailing address from you, I'll be happy to send those out. I just learned how to click to ship from my own home. I can't believe I waited <laughs> three years to figure that out. But boy, does that make life easier. But well, um, any other questions or thoughts before? We yeah, I tell you, Adam. Well, let's let's send you off with a fun one here. So, so uh, obviously you're well versed in the in the topic you you presented on today. But 
what's something surprising that you learned through the process of writing uh, writing your book? What's something that you learned throughout that process that you didn't really expect to, or that that was fun for you? Okay, I'll tell you the one that my favorite thing was. Somebody told me somebody has to read it out loud to you because you write and you write and you write and you just get sick of looking at your book, your work, and it's just absolutely, you, you get blind to the craziness that you just wrote. So my wife and I would spend an hour or two every other night and we would read it. She would read a chapter out loud to me on the sofa right behind me. And it was just the neatest thing really for, for both of us to just, first of all, how redundant I am. Oh my God. So we cut out thousands and thousands of words, but, but just, it helped her understand what it is I actually do and why I do it. There were stories, she's in the book. There are stories of how, like I said, she used wheel of sustainability in our kitchen and just about kicked me out when I suggested to move pots and pans in different locations. But it really also, as solid as our relationship is, it even made it that much stronger. It was so much fun having her read it out to me and listen to her beautiful voice to speaking what I was attempting to write and making it sound so much better when she said it. If we ever did an audio book, which we won't, I'd have her do it. She wouldn't do it. But um, it was just so much fun, but also realizing how difficult it was to understand until she asked those great non-practitioner questions. What in the world do you mean by that? <laughs> Why did you use that word? Oh, that was perfect. Uh, so I did learn that. Have somebody speak it out to you. And you have to have somebody that you trust and, you know, it could be tough if it's somebody that, you know, would be mean. <laughs> we had a lot of fun with it. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Well, I'll tell you what, with about two and a half minutes to spare, I think we'll call it on that question. You got a lot of love coming in through the chat window. Everyone, uh, thanks everybody for your participation today. I had an absolute blast. I hope that you guys did too. Adam, thank you again so much. And uh, we will see you all kind next time. Oh, that's great. Thank you, guys. Thank you all for showing up.